Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house. I'm new here. <laughs> Real. Today we celebrate the festival of Pentecost. Pentecost is the Greek name for the Old Testament Feast of Weeks. Feast of Weeks was one of those Old Testament festivals that God instituted for his Old Testament people to observe. It was one of the big ones, the big three, where every able-bodied Jewish male, 12 years or older, had to go to the temple in Jerusalem. It was celebrated seven weeks after the first sheaf of the early harvest. And it was also called Pentecost in Greek because it took place 50 days after the Passover Sabbath. It commemorated the gathering of the harvest and also the giving of God's law in Mount Sinai. And so it's most appropriate that God chose that day at the start of his New Testament church. By pouring out his spirit on the church, he empowered his church to this very day to gather that great harvest of souls won by Christ's work, by his perfect life and innocent death and glorious resurrection. We begin with the opening dialogue for Pentecost. Please stand. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God was the Almighty, is in Where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. The Lord said, My Spirit will not contend with man forever. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am faint. O Lord, heal me, for my bones are in agony. Turn, O Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Jesus said to his disciples, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and spirit. Flesh is birth. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus we are the law of the Spirit of life, that set me free from the law of sin and death. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Please remain standing as we sing hymn 477, O Day Full of Grace.
Holy Spirit, God and Lord, come to us this joyful day with your sevenfold gift of grace. Rekindle in our hearts the holy fire of your love, that in a true and living faith we may tell abroad the glory of our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from Acts chapter 2, the account of that first New Testament Pentecost. In, God, in the Old Testament, God poured out his spirit under the prophets so that they could reveal his will. On Pentecost, God poured out his spirit onto his church so that they could proclaim the gospel to the world. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the rushing of a violent wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw a divided tongue that were like fire resting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, since the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak fluently. Now there were godly Jewish men from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. When this sound was heard, a crowd came together and was confused, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. They were completely baffled and said to one another, Look, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them speaking in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia and of Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya around Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring in our own languages the wonderful works of God. They were all amazed and perplexed. They kept saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocked them and said, they are full of new wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and spoke loudly and clearly to them. Men of Judea and all you residents of Jerusalem, <clears throat> understand this and listen closely to my words. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, <clears throat> for it is only the third hour of the day. On the contrary, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. This is what God says will happen in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a rising cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And this will happen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The word of our Lord. Our psalm for today, Psalm 104. O Lord, send out your spirit.
reading for today is also our sermon text, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning at verse 3. Therefore, I am informing you that no one speaking by God's Spirit says a curse be upon Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are various kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are various kinds of service, and yet the same Lord. There are various kinds of activities, but the same God who produces all of them and everyone. Each person is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one person, a message of wisdom is given by the Spirit. To another, a message of knowledge, as the same Spirit provides it. By the same Spirit, faith is given to someone else, and to another, the same Spirit gives healing gifts. Another is given power to do miracles, another the gift of prophecy, another the evaluating of spirits, someone else, different kinds of tongues, and another the interpretation of tongues. One in the same spirit produces all of these, distributing them to each one individually as he desires. The word of the Lord. Please stand for the gospel acclamation.
He says, now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. Literally, spiritual things. Reminding them that these gifts came from the Spirit. And not from them. And then Paul goes on to remind Saving faith in Jesus. He says, you know that when you were pagan, received and somehow led away to mute idols. Therefore I'm informing you that no one speaking by God's Spirit says, a curse be upon Jesus, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Paul wants to ask who But no matter which idol Satan led them to, they received no answers to their prayers and no relief to their fears. But then what would you expect? For they were worshiping and serving idols, which are, well, idols. God, so-called God. Do a thing. That mindless attraction to such nothing was a part of their heathen past. But compatible with who you are in the spirit. You see, all of us are natural born idolaters. Maybe we don't like to admit it, but we are. And we may not bow down before idols of wood or stone. We may not pray to creatures, to angels or saints. But the reality is, is that our hearts are still perpetual idol factories. At the very least, we love to worship and serve ourselves, don't we? In fact, one could make the case that the idolatry practiced today is So that instead of hating and cursing Jesus now, we love Jesus. And we call on his name and use his name to pray, praise, and give thanks. How did that happen? Well, Paul says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. He's not talking about just pronouncing those the syllables of those three words, is he? Any unbeliever can do that. But what no unbeliever can do is speak those words with their mouth as a confession of the faith in their heart. If you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's evidence, that's a sign, if you will, of the presence of the Holy Spirit and His work in you. For the gift of faith in Jesus is not something you can buy at Walmart, or order from Amazon, or making your workshop, but that comes only from the Holy Spirit. 
Some well-meaning but wrong teaching Christians will urge believers to open their hearts to Jesus and make their decision to follow him. Make a do-it-yourself project, especially when it comes to salvation. Paul is true saving faith. If we are, as Scripture clearly says we are, dead, blind, and hostile, then we could never, would never open our hearts to Jesus and make a decision to follow him. Not even on our best days. Take average Joel or Jane unbeliever. Imagine Jesus knocking on the door of their heart. Since they're dead, could they get up and open the door for Jesus? Of course not. And even if they hostile to God. He's the enemy. We cannot by our own reason or strength, our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord nor come to him. If we are to believe and confess in Jesus as our God and Savior, then we need the Holy Spirit to give us the ability to do that. And how does he do that? You know. Faith comes from hearing the message and the message comes through the word of Christ. The Holy Spirit doesn't just zap faith into us. He uses means. He uses tools. alive in Jesus and able to believe in and confess him as Lord. And what does it mean to confess Jesus as Lord in his large catechism? Martin Luther explains from sin, from the devil, from death and all evil. Let this then be the sum of this article that the little word Lord signifies simply as much as Redeemer, i.e. He who has brought us from Satan to God, from death to life, from sin to righteousness, and who preserves us in the same. So the bottom line is that each and every Christian is a Christian only because of the work of the Holy Spirit, working through the gospel. The greatest gift the Holy Spirit has given all of us is saving faith in Jesus. And the Holy Spirit doesn't just give it to us once, but he keeps giving it to us. And we use his word and sacraments. And that's a good thing, because we have powerful enemies who are constantly trying to destroy our faith and lead us away to worship mute idols all over again. You know who they are, the unholy trinity, right? The devil, the world, and your own sinful flesh. And so if you and I are going to keep believing and confessing Jesus as Lord, we need the Holy Spirit to keep doing his work. Through the gospel. The word in the so along with the greatest gift that he gives to all Christians, the gift of saving faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit also gives various gifts to various Christians to be used in support of that faith. When Jesus walked on earth, why did he do miracles? To direct people to him as the only God and Savior. For instance, John says concerning Jesus' first miracle, he revealed his glory and his disciples visibly revealed his glory today. Through his body which is his church, which he has scattered all over the world, including right here. 
And so after reminding those Christians at Corinth the gift of the Holy Spirit that they all had in common, the gift of faith in Jesus, he goes on to remind them that they've revealed other gifts from the Spirit. There are various kinds of gifts with the same Spirit. There are different kinds of ministries that get the same Lord. There are different kinds of activity, but the same God who produces all of them and everyone. The Holy Spirit gives different gifts in different amounts to different Christians in different combinations at different times under different circumstances. Different gifts! But the one in the same Spirit gives them all for the same person, purpose. Each person is given a manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. In each and every believer, the Holy Spirit shows Himself to be present and active through the gifts He gives that believer. First and foremost, that gift of saving faith. But then through those other gifts as well. And when God pours out His Spirit, it's not just for the benefit of that individual believer for the benefit of the whole church, and together as the church, the whole world. The Spirit gives each of us gifts so that other people can see Jesus through us. So that when others see our daily lives, it's apparent that we're children of God through faith in Jesus and temples of the Holy Spirit. What an amazing group of people here this morning. Huh? Not only all people to whom the Spirit has given that greatest gift of believing and confessing Jesus as Lord, but also all people to whom he has and is still giving various other gifts for the common good. Which means we haven't received these gifts to hide them or put them on a shelf and let them be unused. We haven't received them to lord it over others and make them feel inferior. We haven't received them to draw attention to ourselves, but that's exactly what was happening at the Church of Corinth. And that's what can still happen in churches today. Satan loves to divide Christian congregations, and one way he does is by causing confusion about these gifts. Any of you play tuba in band or orchestra? If you did, you know that I did either. Um, but a tuba player doesn't play as loudly as possible to draw attention to himself, does he? That would ruin the whole band and orchestra. Any of you play soccer ever? Maybe. A good soccer player doesn't hog the ball, does he? But he passes it, knowing that providing an assist is just as important as kicking the goal. The same is true in the church as a whole and in this part of the church and this congregation. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are beautiful to behold when they're used in the right way and for the right purpose, to the glory of Jesus and for the common good. And then Paul gives a list of some of those different gifts given by the Spirit to different believers. It's no, by no means exhaustive or the only list. He mentioned the wisdom, message of wisdom, a message of knowledge. Well, every Christian has been made wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus by the Holy Scriptures, haven't they? But some Christians are just gifted to dig into God's Word and have the ability to apply it to their lives and the lives of others. And he talks about faith here. He's not referring to saving faith. We've already said that's the gift that he gives to every believer. Here, when he talks about faith, he's not talking about saving faith, but a heroic faith that some have and do remarkable things with unwavering courage. Maybe it, having a cheerful trust and an unwavering endurance in the midst of life's difficulties, and by that, they, that person encourages their fellow believers as well. And the rest of the gifts that Paul lists here are the more spectacular gifts that he gave the early Christians. Now remember, at that time, they didn't have the complete New Testament scriptures like we do, did they? And so just as Jesus did miracles to prove that he was the Son of God and that his message was from God, he gave people in the apostolic age the ability to do signs and wonders to authenticate their message. And to this end, the Spirit gave certain believers, by no means all of them, 
miraculous powers. For example, Peter and John were able to heal that lame beggar by the temple in Acts 3. And in Acts 2, we, we heard how the apostles were able to speak in foreign languages so that all the people gathered in Jerusalem that they could hear them in their own language. You, you wish you had such spectacular gifts? Do you realize that you have something even more spectacular to draw people's attention to Jesus? You and I have the complete Word of God recorded by men as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And though they wrote it down in Hebrew and Greek, we have it in our own language because God gave the gift of translation to others. One in the same Spirit produces all of these, distributing them to each one individually as he desires. When it comes to the gift of the Spirit, there's no reason for conceit or pride or boasting. For they're all given by God. And neither is there any reason to be disappointed or feel deprived. For every believer here has been given the greatest gift of the Spirit, saving faith in Jesus through the Gospel. And along with that gift, each of us, each of you, there's not one person here that says, I haven't been any, given any gift by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is still present and active, still giving glory to Jesus by giving us gifts. Look around you today and see people gifted by the Holy Spirit. And know that the Holy Spirit is using their gifts to bring glory to Jesus by supporting you in your faith. And also know that the Holy Spirit is using your gifts to bring glory to Jesus by encouraging them in this. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. And on this day when we focus on the person and work of the Holy Spirit, as a confession of faith, we'll use the a third article in Luther's explanation from the small catechism. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? I believe that I cannot by my own thinking or choosing believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church, he daily and fully forgives all sins to me and all believers. On the last day, he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. And I told a few of you that I, I, I don't remember names very well, and I'm going to prove it right away. Um, who was it that asked me a prayer for their sister? I, I, for, I forgot your name and I also forgot your sister's name. My name is Harold. Sandal. I was going to say Sharon, but I had her. In addition to praying for um, the family of Sandra, uh, Harold's uh, sister who uh, uh, passed away. We'll also have a prayer for on this Memorial Day weekend. Spirit of love, teach us to do your will. Preserve our lives. Bring us through all trouble. Lead us on level ground. Come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Spirit of grace, enlighten us with your gifts. Put your word before us in our eyes, ears, and hearts that we may be full of wisdom, knowledge, faith, and all your gifts. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. And the fire of Spirit of mercy, call people everywhere to faith by your gospel. Bring them from the darkness of sin to your wonderful life. 
Open our lips to declare your praise and lead many more to call on the name of the Lord and be saved. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Kindle us, fire your love. Spirit of peace, like a holy wind, blow across the whole world. Govern and guide the leaders of all nations so that your word may have free course and we may live in peace. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Kindle us, fire your love. Spirit of power, strengthen us to do your work for the common good. Give your various gifts to each one of us to meet the needs of your church, that God's kingdom may come and that your glory may be shown. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Spirit of compassion, give your gift of healing to those who suffer illness, pain, or discomfort of mind or body. With the power of your word, turn all hardships into blessings. And give your people patience, character, and hope. Fill, come Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. And we pray with Harold and uh, his family as they mourn the death of his sister. O oh Lord God, Lord of life and death, we thank you for all the mercies which with you bless. Um, Harold's sister now fallen asleep. We pray that you would comfort this family and all who mourn for death with your precious promises. Grant the lifeless body rest and at last, together with us all, a joyful resurrection to life everlasting. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain hearts of wisdom and finally be saved through Jesus Christ, our risen and ever living Lord. And on this weekend set aside to honor those who have died in the service of our country, O oh God, we thank you for giving us such patriotic citizens and a country that chooses to remember them. This weekend we also thank you for the saints who have gone before us in your service and preserve for us the rich heritage of your gospel. We remember the blessings you gave to them and to us through them. Praise to you, O oh Savior, in your eternal glory. And now listen, Lord, to the thoughts and cares of our hearts. Holy Spirit, dwell in our hearts. Rule and direct us according to your will. Comfort us in all temptations and afflictions. Defend us from all error. Lead us into all truth. Keep us steadfast in the true faith and help us increase in love and all good works. That in the end we obtain eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Please stand as we pray. Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning, and we shall hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart. That being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. <coughs> our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. In heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord. Please be seated as we sing our closing hymn, 586, Come Holy Ghost, Creator Bless. <clears throat>
throat is a, a little binder. Uh, uh, Song that uh, I'm sure you're going to, and I know you've had them before. Um, just a wonderful. To talk about some of the major strategic challenges our church body is facing, like retaining. the attendees of this conference were lay people, and a major focus was how to better use their gifts and insights to do more gospel ministry. I imagine that most, if not all of you, are serving as some type of leader or working with leaders in congregations. We had to lean on our lay leadership to get more involved in our outreach and Bible information class training and teaching. This is a really good idea just in general to broaden the ministry and to share the teaching of the small catechism with people that don't have any background in the Bible. Lay people can teach the small catechism. We are members of the priesthood of all the believers. Uh, and what Jesus does in power us to the ministry of teens for us to be able to teach and evangelize. Another major focus of this conference was the importance of healthy congregational culture. Leaders helping shape how people think about gospel ministry. And share a time when you experience an impact on an organization's culture. For example, Multiple presentations talked about the need to think about evangelism differently. Not so much as something the congregation does, but as something that we all do. Talking to people about Jesus as God provides us opportunities. 
in order for our congregations to do evangelism to the best of their ability, we want to get all of our members involved in evangelism. The culture of a congregation is critical to its health and its ability to serve the people in its community. Every congregation has a culture, and you're either shaping it or it's shaping it. It matters because it's these shared thought habits we have that just show up. And we might not even realize it gets in the way of us trying to get stuff done. And so the congregation says, we'd like to be more outreach minded. And what are the thought habits that kind of get in the way? discussed the large changes in the Christian landscape in America. Yet, they 